Blue in the Sky at Night. Good evening. At the present moment, the little planet Pluto is at its closest to the Sun and to the Earth. It won't be as near again for well over a century, even though it's still well over 2,000 million miles away, so this seems rather a good time to say something about it. Well, I'm afraid you're not going to see it unless you've got a pretty good set of star maps and a reasonably powerful telescope, because it is faint. But I can show you where it is. It's in the constellation of Libra, the Balance, roughly between Antares in the Scorpion and Spica in Virgo. Libra itself is not a very prominent constellation. The brightest star, Beta Libra, with the rather barbarous name of Zubanel Shimele, is said to be the only single naked eye star that looks decidedly green, although frankly, I've looked at it many times and it always seems white to me. Now, Pluto is here, but the magnitude is about 14, and that means that Pluto is very faint. I can see it quite easily with my 12 and a half inch telescope, but small telescopes certainly won't show it. And also, Pluto is small. There's a picture taken with one of the world's largest telescopes, and as you can see, Pluto, on the edge of that arrow, simply appears rather like a star-like point. Now, that's strange, because all the other outer planets are large. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, all very much larger than the Earth. And they, of course, have surfaces made up of gas instead of being solid and rocky. And the Earth's pretty small compared with them. But nevertheless, the Earth is very much larger than Pluto. And in fact, Pluto appears to be even smaller than our moon. So it simply doesn't seem to fit into the general pattern at all. And ever since it was discovered, in 1930, it has set astronomers puzzle after puzzle. The story of Pluto really goes back a couple of hundred years now. There are five planets visible with the naked eye, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and they've been known since the dawn of human history. Then, in 1781, William Herschel, a then unknown amateur, examining the sky with a homemade telescope, discovered another planet, the one we now call Uranus, and Uranus is shown there together with um, four, of its, uh, four of its 15 moons. Uranus moves around the Sun at a distance very much greater than that of Saturn, the outermost planet previously known, and Uranus has a revolution period of 84 years. You can just about see it without a telescope if you know where to look. And, of course, it's now been surveyed by Voyager 2. There's a Voyager 2 picture taken in January 1986. It doesn't show a great deal, but Uranus is rather a featureless kind of world. Diameter, about 30,000 miles, and again, a surface made up of gas. Well, Uranus discovered in 1781. The first thing that mathematicians do is to set to work and find out how the planet's meant to move. And before very long, it became only too clear that Uranus was not behaving. It was wandering away from its appointed path. Therefore, something unknown was pulling on it. And two mathematicians, John Couch Adams in England and Urbain Leverrier in France, independently decided that this unknown disturber must be another planet moving around the sun at a still greater distance. And it was a kind of a cosmic detective problem. They could see how Uranus was being pulled out of position, and they had to find out where the new planet was. And uh, at the Berlin Observatory in 1846, using this telescope, the planet was found using Leverrier's observations, just about where Adams and Leverrier had expected. It was named Neptune. And it turned out to be very much the same size as Uranus, about 30,000 miles across. Actually, very slightly smaller than Uranus, rather more massive. Too faint to be seen with the naked eye, and uh, like Uranus, with a gaseous surface. From Earth, you can't see very much on it, but here's the very latest picture sent back from Voyager 2, and you can start to see detail. Voyager 2 will bypass Neptune next August. The sky at night, of course, will be over at the headquarters in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we'll bring you back all the news as we get it. I think it's going to be very exciting indeed. Well, once again, the solar system appeared to be complete, but was it? There was still something just a bit unexplained about the movements of Uranus and Neptune. So could there be yet another planet there? One man who believed there was, was Percival Lowell. Now Lowell we remember, rather sadly, as being the man who believed that there were canals upon Mars. But he did a great many other important things, and he built a large observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona, 
and equipped it with a magnificent 24-inch refracting telescope, which is one of the best in the world, and I know because I've used it myself very often. Lowell made the same kinds of calculations as Adams Oliverier had done, and he worked out a position for yet another planet. And then he started looking for it using that big telescope. Well, he didn't find it. And when he died in 1916, the planet was still unfound. And that was really rather bad luck. We now know why Lowell missed it. It was very much fainter than he'd expected, and many years later, when his photographs were examined, the image of the planet was found on two of them. That was a sheer bad luck on Lowell. So nothing happened for a few years, and then in 1919, similar calculations were made by another American astronomer, W.H. Pickering, and there was a brief hunt at Mount Wilson Observatory, but again, nothing was found, and the matter dropped. From then, in 1929, the astronomers at the observatory Lowell had founded at Flagstaff returned to the matter, and they decided to have another search. And they enlisted the services of Clyde Tombaugh, who was then a young, unknown amateur student. He was given the use of a 13-inch refracting telescope and told to look for the new planet on the basis of Lowell's predictions. And in 1930, he actually found it. And there is the discovery plate. That large, overexposed image down to the lower left is a star. Actually, it's Delta Geminorum. And there is Pluto, indicated by the two marker arrows. And as you can see, it looks just like a star. And that's why Lowell missed it. Incidentally, when Pickering's plates were examined, Pluto was found there too. But uh, by sheer bad luck, on one plate, the image of the planet fell right on top of a star, and another occasion, right on top of a flaw in the photographic plates. That was sheer bad luck. Well, there was the planet. What to name it? One suggestion was Minerva. But that idea was put forward by a very unpopular American astronomer, and it wasn't followed up. The actual name, Pluto, was suggested by Venetia Burney, an 11-year-old Oxford girl, and that was adopted because, after all, Pluto was the god of the underworld and darkness, and Pluto, so far from the sun, must be a very dark and gloomy planet, so the name was quite a good one. I may say that Venetia Burney, that 11-year-old girl, is now Mrs. Fair, and uh, when I met her a little while ago, she told me the whole story. Um, I should explain, by the way, that Mrs. Fair is the one on the right. So there was Pluto. But very soon, it became clear that all was not well. Pluto just didn't seem to fit in. For one thing, it had a very strange kind of path or orbit. Most of the planets go around the sun in orbits which are pretty well circular. But Pluto doesn't. And when at perihelion, or closest point, as it is at the moment, it's actually closer in than Neptune, and the revolution period is 248 years. But I'm glad to say there's no danger of collision with Neptune, because Pluto's orbit is also tilted at the sharp angle of 17 degrees, so the two orbits don't actually cross. But the real problem was Pluto's faintness. If it was faint, it must be small, and if it was small, it couldn't have much mass, and therefore it could not possibly pull a giant planet, such as Uranus or Neptune, out of position. And yet, it was by that very pull that Pluto's position had been forecast by Lowell and by Pickering. So there was something very badly wrong. Either the discovery was sheer luck, and I find that very hard to believe, or else Pluto wasn't the planet that Lowell had predicted, or else Pluto might really be larger than expected. And that was a theory for some time. It was suggested that Pluto might be a rather shiny kind of world, and what we were actually seeing wasn't the full diameter of Pluto at all, but merely a shiny part. So that if we could have seen the entire disk, we would have realized that Pluto was much larger than it appeared. A nice theory, but unfortunately it was soon found to be wrong, because using the 200-inch telescope at Palomar Observatory in America, Gerard Kuiper measured the diameter again, and although the result was pretty uncertain, he did establish that Pluto could not be any larger than the Earth and therefore it could not possibly pull Uranus and Neptune out of position. On the other hand, it's remarkably difficult to measure the apparent diameter of a very small body a long way away. One method, developed only in the fairly recent past, is that of occultations. As Pluto moves across the sky, it must occasionally pass in front of a star and hide or occult it. And the time taken for Pluto to pass across the star gives you the apparent diameter of Pluto, and hence its real diameter, because after all we know how far away Pluto is and also how fast it's moving. 
But of course, Pluto is a slow mover, and it doesn't very often occult a star. And in order to uh, get a better idea of the orbit, many photographs taken at the United States Naval Observatory were examined. And a very strange thing was found. Pluto seemed to be irregular in shape. There was a kind of a bump there. So was it a bump, or could it be that Pluto was not alone and had a companion body with it? And when better images were obtained from Hawaii, it was found that that was the answer. And there is Pluto to the left, separated quite clearly from its attendant, the body we now call Charon. By the way, that handle effect and the irregular shapes are, of course, pure instrumental defects. But Pluto is not alone. It has a companion, a satellite. And I think the name Charon's a good one. Because after all, Pluto was the god of the underworld. And Charon was the gloomy ferryman who took departed souls to Pluto's kingdom across the river Styx. And I do realize that the name really should be pronounced Charon. But that causes confusion with another body, as I'll explain later. So I'm going to call it Charon. And pronunciation experts, please don't write to me about it. Now, Charon turned out to be very unusual. To start with, it and Pluto were close together, only about 12,000 miles apart. It had already been found, from variations in brightness, that Pluto has a longish day. It spins round in 6.3 Earth days. And it transpired that Charon went round Pluto in exactly the same time. So that if you were standing upon Pluto, Charon would appear fixed in the sky. And that's a case unique in the solar system. But more than that, once you know how two bodies pull up on each other, you can work out how large and how massive they are. And it was confirmed that both Pluto and Charon are really small. Pluto's diameter is 1,520 miles, and Charon's is only 745, just about half. And even put together, they wouldn't make up one body as massive as the moon. So the situation was very strange indeed. And that was the state of play in 1980, when we had the famous Pluto conference at Las Cruces, where Clyde Tombaugh is now. And at the great banquet there, Clyde was presented with a special shield and a plaque to commemorate his discovery 50 years earlier. And yet, you know, Pluto, as I say, just didn't seem to fit. It didn't appear to be a proper planet at all. And all kinds of ideas were put forward. For example, could Pluto possibly be a former satellite of Neptune? Now, Neptune has two known satellites, and the system's rather strange. The inner satellite is a big one, probably bigger than our moon. That's called Triton. And it goes round Neptune in a wrong way or retrograde direction, like a car going the wrong way in a roundabout. The other satellite's a small one, the Iliad, and that has a very strange eccentric path, rather like that of a comet. And it was suggested that something very strange happened in the solar system thousands of millions of years ago. The Pluto was once a satellite of Neptune, some disturbance pulled it away, threw Triton into that wrong way orbit, and nearly it into that very eccentric one. A nice idea, but there are very grave mathematical objections to it, and I don't think many people believe that now. Secondly, could Pluto possibly be an asteroid, or rather, with Charon, a double asteroid? Now, most of the asteroids, or minor planets, keep strictly to the area between Mars and Jupiter, but there are one or two that don't. And in 1977, Charles Coel discovered Chiron, and that spends most of its time between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus, and it appears to be at least 150 miles across. So could Pluto be another Chiron? Well, Chiron itself has just provided us with a major problem. It brightened up, and it now seems to be showing a kind of a cometary coma, as you can see on that very recent picture taken from Hawaii. And it just could be that Chiron is not really a, an asteroid at all, but a huge comet. We simply don't know. And if that's the case, then certainly Chiron and Pluto are not in the least alike. But then, so far as Pluto was concerned, we had a stroke of luck. The tilts to the orbits of Pluto and Charon mean that for a few years every 124 years, that's half Pluto's revolution period, there are times when Pluto and Charon pass in front of each other. And this happened in the 1980s. And in 1987 and 1988, we had a whole series of occultations of Charon by Pluto and transits of Charon across Pluto. So for that period, you could study them separately, so to speak. And we learned a great deal from that. For one thing, it was found that Pluto has a density about twice that of water, so it must contain a great deal of rock. Secondly, Pluto and Charon were not alike. Pluto seemed to have a coating, at least partially, of methane frost, 
and Charon has a coating of ordinary water ice frost, so the two are not alike at all. And also it became possible to draw up a very elementary map of Pluto. Here it is. Now, I don't know whether you can make much of this. Obviously, it's a false colour map, so the colours mean absolutely nothing. It's a mercator, so the poles are on the top and the equators across the middle. And what we can really find out from that is that Pluto seems to have poles which are brighter than the equator. So there must be frosty polar caps there. And you don't get the same kind of thing on Charon. And then came the question of Pluto's atmosphere. From spectroscopic observations, it had already been very strongly suspected that there might be an appreciable atmosphere made up of methane. But then the occultation method came to our rescue. An occultation of a star by Pluto was carefully observed by astronomers in Australia and New Zealand. And they found that both before and after the actual occultation, the star's light flickered and faded, so that clearly it was coming to us through a layer of atmosphere surrounding Pluto, and going up to something like 400 miles above the planet's surface, very much more than had been anticipated. Charon, on the other hand, appeared to have no atmosphere at all, probably because it is smaller and less massive and has a lower escape velocity. Now, you may ask why Pluto can hang on to an atmosphere, and our moon, which is more massive, can't. And the answer is because Pluto is so much colder, and the atmosphere may not even be permanent. Remember, at the moment, Pluto is at its closest to the Sun. In 124 years, it will be at its furthest, more of over 4,000 million miles away, and very much colder, with a temperature about minus 220 degrees centigrade. And at that temperature, it may well be that the methane atmosphere will actually condense out and cover Pluto's surface with a layer of methane frost. And so for a part of Pluto's long year, it may be either without atmosphere or with an atmosphere very much thinner than it has at the present time. And I wonder what would it be like if we could go there. You're so far from the sun that even the sun will appear only as a brilliant point of light. Charon will appear fixed in the Plutonian sky. You won't see much of the planets, even Uranus or Neptune. have no chance at all of seeing small bodies close to the sun, such as the Earth. And on the surface, there could well be oceans. Not oceans of water, but oceans of methane. A world lonely and desolate beyond our understanding. Unfortunately, none of the current space probes are scheduled to go anywhere near it, and it may be a long time before we find out much more. But I wonder, is Pluto the last planet? Or is there another one out there? Planet X. I believe there is, and it could well be that it is planet X, not Pluto, which caused those perturbations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. At the moment, astronomers at the Lowell Observatory are making a new examination of the many plates taken by Clyde Tombaugh during his planet hunting searches to see whether they can find any evidence for planet X. Whether they will or not, I don't know, but I'm quite sure that it must be there, and one day, if all goes well, we may find it. But meanwhile, Neptune and Pluto mark the boundaries of the Sun's known planetary kingdom. And I think we'd agree that remote, lonely, faint and mysterious though they are, Pluto and Charon are by no means the least interesting members of the Sun's family. Before I go, remember it's time for our summer newsletter. And if you want it, as usual, send a stamped addressed envelope to this address, newsletter number 34, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W12, 8QT. And of course, you can also look us up on CFAX page 187. Next month, I'll be talking to you about the August the 17th eclipse of the moon. Until then, good night. <laughs>